Rides all the way to Thomasville Their maiden names written on the land Echo through the red clay hills Where the scent of long leaf float And pine reach up on past that Georgia line Stroll through Tallahassee town Or southern Appalachia bound Take the local routes and journey down The roads we call our home It's all there in our theme song Canopy Rose, Longleaf Pine, Red Clay Hills. As we see in this special episode of Local Roots, the natural setting we inhabit has influenced our history and our culture. Join us for an ecological exploration of our area. WFSU producer Rob Diaz de Villegas brings us Roaming the Red Hills. Take the local roots and journey down the roads we call our home. Funding for Roaming the Red Hills has been provided by Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. The red cockaded woodpeckers and, and all the rest of the critters have benefited by people doing things for selfish reasons. It's, it's wonderful. The spacing of the longleaf pine forest is known to be wide enough for a wagon to ride through. Every quail season at Elsima Plantation, the Chapin family tests the truth of that as they have for generations. My grandfather came down here in the 1880s as a young guy and really fell in love with it. The first Charles Chapin belonged to a wave of wealthy northerners that became accidental conservationists in the Red Hills region of North Florida and South Georgia. The reason? Bob White quail. False alarm. Yesterday morning we saw 12 coveys all over the place. This dog kept finding bird after bird. This is what makes it fun. We go out and two dogs at a time. Harry will call point when one of his dogs is lucky enough to come upon some birds. And Jeannie runs who gets off next to shoot. Which, I'm a dictator. <laughs> and, and two guns will, will go up and, and uh, try their luck at it. Hunting quail is as much about the experience as it is about the catch. Take the wagon. This one's about 100 years old. With some serious trips to the Amish country in Pennsylvania for repairs, the wheels had been rebuilt. Get in here now! Here! One particular interest of mine is in the bird dogs. I find it fascinating to watch, to work with, to help train, to try to train myself. I know you're trying. So that's been a growing passion. And the riding. I mean, it's such a treat to be out in the woods on these Tennessee walkers. It's just glorious. It really is. Whoa! 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 Come here. Come here. Quail is a firebird. The first few times I went out with our guys burning, it scares the hell out of you. You look behind you and you've set the woods on fire. You but, set uh, your own woods on fire. But then you watch the regrowth of everything and you see what it looks like next year and, and you know it's the right thing to do. Red Hills properties burned before it was accepted practice to do so. They burned to open up the understory for quail. But in the process, they created habitat for a wealth of species, many of which are threatened and they created a contiguous privately owned longleaf forest which complements the publicly owned Apalachicola National Forest to the south. Someone's getting a visitor. In the longleaf pine systems we've got in the southeast, there are three species that are endemic to those pinelands. They don't occur anywhere else. Those are blackman sparrows, brown-headed nuthatch, and the red cockaded woodpecker. Those aren't found anywhere else in the world other than our southern pinelands. There are several other species like northern Bob White that occur elsewhere, but their numbers reach their highest numbers in those, those southern pinelands. Red cockaded woodpeckers make their cavities in longleaf pine trees that are at least 90 years old. Are you ready for a red cockaded woodpecker? Just starting to get a little feathering. Aww. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful. Hi, baby. But see, he still has about another 20 days before he'll fledge from the nest and actually fly on his own. So he's got a lot of developing yet to do. Yet this to do. bird is just seven days old. I bet about 10,000 of these birds are banded each year. 
Well, those are banded on all the uh, managed areas of state and uh, federal lands that hold them. Red cockaded woodpeckers are endangered, but their numbers are rising. It's a species that researchers watch closely. Sit down. Now that's just like you uh, wearing a wristwatch the rest of your life. Only three million acres of longleaf habitat remain from the original 90 million. Of that, only 10,000 acres have never been cut. That's tough on a bird that needs older trees. The Red Hills is a stronghold for the red cockaded and other longleaf dependent species. This is an old river delta that we're standing on right now that hundreds of thousands of years ago deposited some unique sort of clay soils here. And that scarp that's run on the south side of Tallahassee extends out to the Oscilla River on the east and off to the Ocloctay River to the west. And those two rivers sort of form the boundary. And so we call this Red Hills region. If you haven't yet gotten a good look at an eastern Phoebe, there are two in this pine and three that way. Jim takes an FSU biology class to one of those rare pieces of land where longleaf has never been cut. It's a birder's paradise. At Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy, Jim shows the class research plots burned at one, two, and three year intervals. Let's take a look between the pines. Note the openness of the one year plot. If you listen to the naturalists that came to this region back in the 1800s, they described these areas as being these pinelands with a grassy understory. So it's a natural system that had these grasses that held on for decades and would burn very frequently. Basically, they support a lot of the species that are very important to these pinelands. So you guys want to scope a burrow and see if we see a tortoise? Yeah? Who's my first volunteer? We're on a former hunting plantation. Many Red Hills landowners embraced their role as accidental conservationists, putting land in conservation easements. Some went further. Tall Timbers Plantation became a research facility. Birdsong Nature Center invites the public to explore the longleaf ecosystem. The longer you stay, the more you see, and then as it gets colder in the winter, you see more birds. And right now we're seeing migratory birds. Today, some local families have come to learn about one of the most critical species found at Birdsong. But look at their front feet. They're just like shovels. They're sort of flattened and they have very long, thick toenails. And they can use those to dig very, very effectively. So when their fire comes across the landscape, guess what tortoises do? They go in their burrows and that protects them from the fire. Gopher tortoises are not only adapted to survive fire, they thrive in the habitat it helps create. And if we don't use fire as a main tool and we let the canopy grow up, and we get the forest really thick, then tortoises will move away. So it's really important that we maintain this nice open habitat so we have lots of good ground forage for tortoises to want to be here. Like red cockaded woodpeckers, gopher tortoises are affected by the loss of longleaf habitat. There's a lot of habitat loss for these gopher tortoises. And in fact, they think that we have um, more than 80% fewer tortoises than we used to have in just the last 100 years or so. Whoa, well, I feel something. You feel something? Okay, so that's The kids try good. their hand at gopher tortoise research field work. Kind of stable and you want to be able to This see includes that. using some nifty okay. hardware. So now we're going to feed feed it in slowly and try to watch the monitor as you do it. So let's back up just a little bit. Okay, let's back up a minute. Oh, oh there's crickets. <laughs> there's crickets. All right, look at us go. Yay, good job. Tortoises are called like an ecosystem engineer Very or a keystone cool. species two two. because they dig these oh, burrows that a lot of other animals depend upon. All come in, baby, all come in. Maybe we could all come in. And if we were to get rid of tortoises, then we would get, get rid of their burrows, which would affect a lot of other animals that use these burrows. You open up your door just a little more. Maybe we could all come in. Drop off your couch, have a seat on the floor, and maybe we could all come in. Oh, come in, baby, all oh, come in. Maybe we could all come in. Oh, come in, baby, all oh, come in. Maybe we could all come in. We're
lucky in this area, and maybe we don't, we don't always realize it, because we do have so much of our native ecosystem left with the Red Hills plantations that have been maintained with fire for many years. Places like this that have been protected from development. And so the natural community is here as it has been for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Lost Creek Forest in Thomasville, Georgia, gives us a glimpse of what forests looked like before European settlement. It may also give us an insight into the people who lived here then. From a Native American standpoint, an indigenous person standpoint, areas like this were important. Um, just like those of you that are hunters, nowadays you know that critters like to live where there's edge, where there's different habitat types that come together. This is a natural edge between the frequently burned uplands and the bottomlands. Important items like clothing and rope were made from available plants and animals. This is yucca, yucca filamentosa. There's some of it over there. See that? Get you down to the fiber and just that's just... Joe bad. is making Very a bowstring. You can put it in your mouth and go like this. And that's a lot quicker, okay? Just twist it with both hands at the same time. Yucca is one of the many plants that make Lost Creek biologically unique. To members of the community, it's an ecosystem worth saving. It's a really special remnant of what the natural landscape was like before the Europeans came. In 2008, there was a plan to turn this into an industrial park, and we had a grassroots movement, and in five weeks we did just an amazing uh, organizational job and convinced the county not to uh, sell it for that purpose. And this is partridge berry that you see growing here underneath. You'll see some with little red berries on it. This was one of the two vines that the botanists all said this is a old growth, non-disturbed forest because they wouldn't be here in this quantity. In the old growth, the community has been growing and changing on its own over the millennium and anything that's been cut or certainly farmed and plowed and that kind of thing, it just never will be that same way. They have a lot of trees and a lot of species here that you find further north and you see them in assemblages here that you don't see a lot in our area. actually very close to the headwaters of the Alcilla. Lost Creek is one of the main headwaters. And the Alcilla flows down from here in Thomas County and flows all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a very important river ecologically, historically. It's a clean river and it all starts right here. So from that fact alone, it's really important to preserve areas like this because they are the headwaters of our rivers. A similar slope forest property was saved in neighboring Grady County. And Wolf Creek is just so unique. I mean, we don't know that there's that many trout lilies anywhere in the world, certainly of that species. And here it is in South Georgia, where it doesn't really even quote belong. Where Lost Creek feeds the Oscilla, Wolf Creek feeds the other main Red Hills River, the Oclock. Oh, yeah. yeah, this portion is generally a lot easier to navigate. Shoot the two. When you get to where are you going, it don't matter how long this old river will still be flowing. It was here when we came, it'll be here when we're gone. Maybe your school field trips didn't look like this. These students from Thomas University are gathering geographic information to make maps for a paddling trail being developed in Georgia. Two years ago, the Clackney River Water Trail, Margaret Tyson started the program. And so I saw a wonderful opportunity to use this uh, for a geographic information system. That would be a wonderful uh, contribution to help them to jumpstart it. Part of our mission today is to recon the this portion of the river and we have actually run into some deadfall and that's one of the things that we want to identify today. This is part of it, right here. The wild adventure of the o'clock. I was just, well, I was just eating a little willow. <laughs> Thank y'all. Yeah. 
Braxton marks blockages using the GPS. He's been busy. How many spots like this have you GPS? Do you know? I should have close to five or six. I also GPS the small spring flowing into the Oclockney. Not sure where it goes to though, but it it seemed to, it was pretty neat to to GPS that right there. They also clear some snags to improve navigability. <laughs> a trip like today's can be fun if you're not in a hurry. It lets you get to know the river and the land around it. On this side of the river is a conserved piece of land called Deerwood Plantation. And as we paddle down to the south, we'll be then connecting with another easement on Mistletoe Plantation. Oh, December, mere words cannot portray Having this land undeveloped and conserved definitely helps with erosion. It's natural, water quality, filtration. It's a natural corridor for wildlife. It's, it's excellent. Today, we are doing one of our first ever O'Clockney River bio blitzes. And basically, all we're trying to do is just go out and catch as many species as we can. We know there's about 170 species. It's my dog. Dar Dar! We have about 170 species that are endemic to this area of the southeast, so really trying to highlight some of those today and bring attention to this river too because in Florida it goes through a lot of natural areas, but in Georgia it goes through a lot of agricultural land, so we want to bring attention to it, make sure it stays clean. Georgia's O'Clockney River collects pollutants from farms, wastewater treatment facilities, and industrial sources. Fortunately for us today, the worst of it stays behind the Jackson Bluff Dam. We're just south of the dam in the Apalachicola National Forest. And it also feeds that huge marine estuary down there, which is really important for Florida's seafood industry. But why go all the way to the bay for some fish? Good job, what a team! What a yeah. team! That one, we think it's a seminal quail fish. You can see that one has, you can see kind of lines on the side and it has that reddish orangey kind of fin right there. That's typical of the male. Rebecca is helping to identify some of the species that kids have found. Yeah. Most turtles, you know, have a hard shell. These have a soft shell, but what they lack in armor, they make up for with jaws and claws. We got 25 species I think are on our list right now, so pretty good day for a couple hours in the morning. You know, this river has a lot of facets to it, it's a lot of different parts, which makes it really cool and we just want to get it on people's radar, something that we need to really enjoy like we did today, but also take care of and keep clean. Farm to table. The ingredients on this plate didn't travel far to get here. From the time of the native Appalachian, the soils of the Red Hills have been good to farmers. And that means fresh, local ingredients for new Sweetgrass cheese shop chef, Wes Kent. These are from Breaking Away Farms in Meigs, Georgia. It's a really beautiful produce, just like all of our other Red Hills market. Wes appreciates that the way food is raised affects the way it tastes. 
Sweetgrass Dairy was started in 2000 by my parents, Al and Desiree Wainer. They had farmed conventionally and switched over to a New Zealand rotational grazing style farm in 1993. The milk was so different from cows out on grass that they really wanted to show people the importance of knowing where their food comes from. After the family's success creating artisanal cheeses, Jessica and her husband Jeremy opened the cheese shop. Their mission is to promote like-minded farms in the community. This is part of what brought Wes back to his hometown. I moved back to incorporate seasonality into the, the cuisine of Thomasville and to educate the community more on local farms and good food. These are from Turkey Hill Farm. Gotcha. I eat dulce. It's, it's a sweet chili, as it's called in Spanish. We use a lot of the Red Hills market vendors. We're using a lot of Turkey Hill Farms, Orchard Pond. I like all the local farmers, Turkey Hill, Breaking Away Farms, um, Full Earth, Full Earth in, in, uh, in Quincy, uh, you know, anybody that gets excited about the stuff that they do. So this is our next course. It's a super traditional French home meal. It's a, called a cassoulet, and it could be cooked with rabbit or duck or chicken, really any meat. Farms uh, put in a lot of hard work, okay. like and Sweetgrass wants to respect all that goes into creating distinct flavors. Both Jeremy and Wes have the same kind of feeling in the kitchen, is that people are working so hard to grow this incredible produce. This is a Seminole pumpkin from Turkey Hill Farms. They just don't want to mess it up and let the product speak for themselves. Yeah, we want to share it the way it was intended. We're not trying to cover it up. The Red Hills farming tradition has deep roots. With little access to recreational equipment, we had to make our own, of course, we had to use what we had, nature and the lake. We grew up with the knowledge that we had to use our mind to create, rather than just depend on others to create for you, but we had to create our own, which is, uh, which is good. We're at the Jones Tenant House at Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. Like many hunting plantations, Tall Timbers had once rented its land to African American farmers. When a luster painted the displays here, he drew upon a childhood growing up on a tenant farm by Lake Jackson. This is a just an everyday typical scene of, of the, uh, the activities during that time. I think they used the same blueprint for every house in the area because all of them was made the same. The one I grew up in was a, a block house, but uh, just a short distance away, my grandmother lived in a house just like this. Rooms like this is kind of familiar. We took a bath right in front of the fireplace because that's the only source of heat. We wrap up and run to the bed, and <laughs> of course, you have to jump in right away because it was so cold. Blending family memories and historical research, Alustor carefully planned and composed every scene. This is the pencil drawings of the Tall Timbers project. The composition uh, evolved as it was by. reviewed. You know, I had more trees and I uh, had more people and it changed the mew. And the Jones House paintings were done in watercolor, but Alustor also does oil and even sculpture. One of my ballet pieces for my upcoming show is going to showcase uh, variety of cultural dances. Each culture has a dance they identify with. This is the African tribal dance here, and this is, this is an oil, and of course that's, I want to capture that rhythm of dance. After retiring as a telephone engineer, Aluster has become a successful artist, but that wasn't part of his career plan. I never thought in a million years I would be an artist to come back and reproduce the everyday scenes we took for granted during that time. To recreate my childhood was a, such a pleasure to do that. A big part of that childhood was Lake Jackson. Of course, I grew up within walking distance of Lake Jackson, and of course, we either fish in our spare time or during hunt season, we hunt, and the lake was accessible, so duck hunt was one of our things. Today is the last day of duck season in Florida, January 31st. So there's lots of people who want to get in uh, that last shot. 
Even before sunrise, the sounds of wildlife are thick on Lake Ammonia. Lake Ammonia is one of the Red Hill's four sinkhole lakes directly feeding the Floridan aquifer. The water in our springs and in our taps comes from the aquifer. In the Red Hills, that water is well protected by a thick layer of clay sediments. It's less protected in these lakes. Healthy habitats make for cleaner water, and they provide a host of recreational opportunities. And if the fish don't bite and the ducks don't land, there are worse places to be. It's been dismal. The worst year in my lifetime in terms of ducks being here while the season is open. Because of the warm weather up north until recently and until it freezes over in Canada and the northeast, they don't leave to come south. And that just occurred, what, last week? And ducks started filtering in. Straight out in front of us, the circle. Yesterday it was steady and we were done by eight o'clock and everybody was picking up by eight o'clock. This is Lane's spot on a sunnier day. It does have favorable features. And ringnecks are diving ducks, which means that you'll see them sitting out here today. They'll be sitting on top of the water all of a sudden, ploop. Out in the uh, bonnets, we call them air lily pads. They feed on dollar bonnets, the smaller ones, and coontail moss, which is underneath this water. And for some reason today, it could be the weather, could be the overcast. Yesterday was very sunny. Today, the ducks have been avoiding the open water. But even on a rough day at the end of a rough duck season, Lane keeps his sense of humor. My family and I enjoy eating ducks, and I enjoy hunting them and bringing them home. And my wife keeps saying, she used to say, did you kill any ducks? I said, no. Now she says, did you see any ducks? <laughs> In the winter months, blue peats actually coots the stringers from ducks by a great beard were plentiful. A number of the women were excellent cooks. Our little Mitchell was one of these cooks. She also cooked duck and blue peats that would fall off the bone and prepared what she called a low gravy. This area is a great area for cyclists because lots of country roads out here in Jefferson County and they're real pretty places to ride. Before we connect with the rural heritage of Jefferson County, a pit stop at a place that embraces the small farms of today. When we first opened, the big concept was, um, you know, everything from scratch, just like grandma used to make. And we've tried little by little, you know, as much as we can to add more organic and more locally sourced stuff. And I, I love supporting the Red Hills Farm Alliance because I think they're doing a great thing. Our riders are following Jefferson County's Heritage Road map to West Lake Road, where local historian Flossie Bird moved in 1940. She was 13. First impressions put into perspective, I soon began to appreciate that Jefferson County was and for the most part, continues to be a beautiful environment. And we were fussing and crying and going on after a while we realized that they weren't going to turn around and take us back to Haines City. We were on our way to Monticello. The first thing we asked when we jumped out of the car was where was the school? Dr. Bird went to school by the Junius Hill Missionary Baptist Church which was established by Andrew Jackson Junius shortly after the Civil War. Students' learning stretched beyond the classroom as they helped gather firewood and cook lunches. 
was a two-room school, three teachers. Some of the young people got upset about the fact that they had to go to the field instead of going to school. We didn't stay out of school a day just to be working on the farm. A few miles down the road is Ford Chapel AME Church, which also had a school. Ford Chapel and Junius Hill were the cornerstones of twin African-American communities. Whoever was teaching at Junius Hill sometimes, all those children that are there get in a row and come down here. And then sometimes the teacher take all the children from here and they'd go up there, they'd go visit them. And somebody said, that gave them a way not to have to teach that. <laughs> but anyway, it was life on the farm. With her parents shouldering the farm work while the kids stayed in school, Dr. Bird and her siblings were excellent students. I graduated as a valedictorian in my class and went to Florida and m master's at Penn State, doctorate from Cornell. She taught in Texas for over 30 years. Unlike many in her generation, she returned to Monticello. And then, of course, the, then you had the exodus when people started leaving the rural area and going to town and then going to other areas. The progression away from the farm, there wasn't anybody here to farm. If somebody doesn't write it, it will be just as if we never existed. Funding for Roaming the Red Hills has been provided by Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. 